uh, Jessica and Annelik, but also this wonderful team, uh, Georgia, Allison, for bringing us here and uh, our very generous hosts. It's been really an um, amazing two days, very inspiring, very dense and very much we've been taken care of really in a wonderful way. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, then what I will do is uh, after these really interesting excursions to, um, to activism, to I would say a s cultural, social, co collaborative practices, um, I'll bring the discussion maybe back uh, to more That's new, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to more, um, let's say, prefabricated, standardized, but also hegemonic and still very powerful uh, uh, concepts of art and art institutions and their relation to um, environmental um, issues. Uh, but I would like to start by referring to an article that I actually just read in the German news uh, weekly newspaper Die Zeit from last week, and maybe some of you um, happen to just, um, see it too. The author wrote about um, a certain form of labor division that modern societies have developed in dealing with massive themes such as the so-called envir environmental crisis. So there's the field of science, which is in charge of producing uh, knowledge and facts, insights, that then the field of politics uh, is supposed to pick up and convince people of the necessity for change and inducing this change. And then there's the field of art, which um, is constitutes the field where reflection takes place, refinement and critique, where narratives and images are produced and rewritten. Recently, however, scientists had to learn bitterly that this kind of labor division doesn't really work anymore. Even though they keep providing pressing proofs for the dramatic urgency of the situation, most governments don't do anything. Part of that has certainly to do with the scale of the challenge we are dealing, and it's been mentioned often in the last days, with the transition into a new epoch, the age of the Anthropocene, characterized by humans not only unfolding a, signif a significant impact on biological, uh, geological and atmospheric processes, but in fact disturbing these processes to an extent where their own living conditions are put to danger. So insights alone don't lead to change. And it's not a new thing that in this situation the arts are addressed. When no one knows where to do, they turn to artists, hoping that they, directors, artists, writers, and composers, produce images, shake people up, enlarge their horizons in ways that are more direct, more appealing, more accessible than reason alone. So what can we do? Of course, it is fantastic that finally, after about 40 years of eco-movements, uh, an awareness of these topics has reached the art world that so far, all in all, had not been particularly interested in these matters. And of course, it is necessary that we undertake processes of self-interrogation, um, as all of us anyway need to do, not just as being involved in the arts, but as producers and consumers that we all are. Jessica said in her first um, opening speech, how come we say one thing and then behave in completely different ways? Um, that's not just true for MoMA, <laughs> it's true for all of us. Uh, because um, largely the artwork also puts a focus on saying things, visually, textually, acoustically. Um, but we all know that this crisis won't be solved by saying, but it's a matter of doing. Um, so to which extent do we all form part in co-producing and sustaining the mindset that led to this crisis that we are now facing? Much has been said about the resource hungriness about, uh, of the art world, the insanity of traveling from one art fair to the next biennial of both visitors and artworks, the craziness of packaging, etc. So these are quite obvious factors. What I would like to focus on is a kind of involvement that goes far deeper and therefore is also less obvious and maybe even less conscious. The field of art has always, since actually the 16th century, I would say, um, 
reflected and mirrored basic socioeconomic orders of its respective time. So this resource-hungry socioeconomic order that we're talking about and the field of art, they both share not just similarities or structural affinities, but the same DNA up to its very basic structure. Which means, I'll, I'll come and ex explain a little bit what I mean by this, but what this ultimately means, and this is basically my main point, if we really take our interest in this environmental issues and sustainability serious, I mean really serious, we have to fundamentally re rethink both the idea of art, but also institutional formats um, where we experience art. So now I would, oh maybe, can I do this now? Ah oh yeah. Um, let me start with this. You know I'm an art historian, so I felt like I, had, I need to bring some historical stuff in. So what we see here is um, a drawing from the early 19th century. So it's the birth moment of museums all over Europe, mainly I heard France, Germany, uh, England, and so on. So you might see it's a caricature. It appears in a newspaper in the early 19th century. In France, um, people uh, made fun of peasants, countryside people, uneducated people, uh, coming from the villages, from the suburbs, from the countryside to Paris. They go to the Louvre for the first time, and what do they do in front of a religious painting? They kneel down and pray. Um, a few years later, uh, Karl Friedrich Schinkel in Berlin uh, built the Altes Museum um, to host the royal collections on the museum islands. Uh, island and um, in this drawing kind of presents the counter model to this uh, left um, modality. So the old mindset, the new mindset, the religious mindset, the secular mindset, the mindset of belief and humbleness, praying, kneeling, genuflection, the new mindset of um, being engaged in what we could call rational amusement and at the same time ready to learn, to not believe, but to engage in a secular, meaning historical, intellectual way with art. Um, mainstream narratives say the left is kind of the ritual and the right is secularization, modernity. I would say a new kind of ritual emerged in a ritual that cultivates secular values. A new kind of belief system, you could e even say, that believes in the value of critical judgment, secularization, rationalization, and contemplation. What lies in between these two images, or what marks the transition from the left to the right, is, I would say, a process of separation, a process of mental distancing, you don't critically judge something you're, you believe in or you're immersed in or you're deeply connected to. You need to kind of act out this form of separation to first come into a position where you s can judge or critically analyze or compare as these people do in the museum. I'm interested in this, in this um, principle of separation because if we look further, we could say that it's, it runs through almost everything in exhibitions and museums on very different levels. Um, but of course we could say it starts with the X minus inhibited. It works better in German, ausgestellt, <laughs> for those of you who speak German. <laughs> uh, artwork, so as an object that before it's been put on display, goes through an act of separation, an act of being taken out of its previous networks, we could say, or even ecological milieu, if we want, context, right? Um, so we, an altar painting before the revolution, in a church, we wouldn't say it's exhibited, it's more embedded. It's part of a decorum, it's part of a space um, that, that is uh, decorated for, for ceremonies, only removed from this altar, separated from this old cosmology of belief, um, liberated, we could say. It, it 
ex it can be exhibited, ausgestellt. To then in the museum be, oh, this is another example for kind of pre-exhibition space, where also you see a lot of sculptures, but they are embedded, not exhibited. Um, now let me go back uh, for a moment. Um, of course, once it's put into the museum, it's brought in touch with multiple other forms of separation. For instance, separation of the senses, you know, the focus on viewing, uh, thereby discrediting all other senses. It's, very, it's a relatively new thing that artworks were not allowed to be touched. It's like 200 years old. Before, smell, touch, all these other senses were also had a certain significance, but of course it's a Western hierarchy of the senses that privileges visuality. Why? Because visuality is a distancing sense. Imagine you would only see me but not hear me. I mean, it's hard enough to create a connection with you when I'm speaking, but if I couldn't <laughs> speak, it would be very alienated. Yeah? Or com think of yourself when you, when you listen, a con like a, the audience of a concert, I as opposed to visitors in a museum. It's a completely different form of shared um, encounter or shared experience through hearing. Um, so Georg Simmel, the German sociologist, said this, like vi the visual, the, the eye, the, the visual sense is a distancing sense. Um, if you look, if, you if we go through the history of museum, we can see that they are, along the centuries, you know, a work operate almost as machines to single out people. And with, from these huge crowds at the beginning to the kind of, 19th century of the individual that of course didn't fall from the sky it kind of had to be produced and museums were machines you could say to produce this idea of the of the modern individual um, I think yeah this is the paint uh, this is the image I wanted to show you because it's really interesting if we can we can basically retell the entire history of individualization yeah so being <coughs> the driving social engine one could say of modern societies along the increase of wall space in museums from these very crowded 19th century spaces to the white cube with like one painting or one image uh, one sculpture and hardly any people you hardly find people in installation shots um, then in, in in the 20th century so um from these crowded, packed, decorated spaces to the white cube, which of course is the paradigmatically cleared space, a Cartesian space, a space where any kind of real world influence is either excluded or controlled. Um, therefore, it's so interesting what uh, Philippe Ram proposed yesterday, or this work that he does on not kind of regulating climate in these spaces, but finding a different way of interacting with it. Um, so from an anthropological perspective, we could say that all societies have developed ritual forms of bringing their people together. This is one. Um, it's the one that is similar to the theater, the one that speaks to the many. Um, but it's very unusual that societies create a ritual that aims to separate, to distance, to detach. It's very unique and it's very peculiar also. A ritual that immerses people into separation. I don't think any other culture has produced that. And of course, this is not a coincidence or I came up with this idea. <laughs> and it's, if you think of it, a pretty peculiar uh, idea also. And why? Why was that? Why, how could that become so popular? This is Louvre, Abu Dhabi, and uh, MoMA. I mean, so popular that it spreads all over the planet. Why? Um, <laughs> the answer is pretty <laughs> obvious. Because this, print, this modality of separation that is inscribed into its DNA and acted out on so many different levels, of course, is also the driving principle of Western modern societies, politically, or let's say intellect mentally in the history of thought, secularization, enlightenment, uh, politically li uh, liberalism, um, the idea that to detach is something emancipatory. <laughs> Makes sense in the 18th century, you know, where people were for centuries were kind of bound into, you know, very rigid 
belief systems of the church, emperors, and so on. So to liberate the individual as like a driving, but the, the idea that to detach is, is something emancipatory. It's like an engine that drives Western liberal thinking since the 17th century. Um, Ulrich Beck, the German uh, sociology that passed away a while ago, once was, was once asked, like, what, what does individu individualization mean? And he, his answer was, it means when I ask who I am, no longer reply with the saying, I'm the wife of, I'm Swiss, I'm Catholic, I say just, I'm I. <laughs> it's me, yeah? So I have separated from all these bonds that appear being too rigid. Um, you know, sociologists differentiate between strong bonds and weak bonds. Strong bonds are rigid bonds, uh, family, uh, marriage, um, religion, nation, and so on. To, to transition into weaker bonds, bonds that are based on choice, um, is a very, very strong social dynamic. Yeah? Up to the point where even this, the, what seems to be, or historically kind of seemed always to be the most strongest bond, the one, the bond to your own gender is up to choice, really, up to being a matter of choice, basically. So this principle of detaching and understanding this as some, something emancipatory in thought, in the history of uh, uh, intellectual history, in, in politics or social dynamics, but also, of course, um, economically. I mean, only only the fact that people no longer as understood themselves as being intrinsically connected with nature enabled them to use it as a resource, as Bestand, as Heidegger would call it, yeah? which then led to in a massive increases in productivity and affluence and all that. I mean, all this was extremely productive, of course, otherwise, okay, five more minutes. Um, so my main point, uh, all these forms of separation, politically, economically, artistically, culturally, derive from the same origin. They all come from the same mindset. It's a structural feature of modernity that acts out in our socio-economical order and the field of art is the ritual that cultivates it. Artworks are the props, <laughs> basically. So I argue that the fundamental problem of modernity this principle, which we today might see as a problem, marks both the beginning of what we call autonomous art, which is the art since 1800, basically, as well as the core of the sustainability problem. So there is a connection between the assumption that we can take this object out of its ecological milieu and put it on a white pedestal, and then it represents meaning by somehow magically by itself, um, and the idea that we can extract resources. These two are, th they, it, th they are driven by the same mindset. It's, it's, it's as, as we heard yesterday several times, it's, it's all connected. That makes it not easier, but it's something you have to um, be aware of. So now I have to speed up. So, um, which by the way, of course, is why all these kind of immersive um, aesthetics that come up, I would say, at the moment as search movements all over the place are interesting, um, but that's a different theme maybe. So three consequences that I would, uh, uh, um, from, from what I said that I would like to point out. First, art as we know it since 18, the 1800s and in very f many aspects of these general aspect uh, of these general notions or ideas you find in museums all over the place. I mean, what we've been discussing here is wonderful but very specific cases. But I mean, mainstream museums all over the world, you, you, you know them, they look all the same and they look like this. Um, this is what I was saying, you know, these two kind of ritualistic forms, theater, the one to the many, depicting strong bonds, depicting, you know, bringing the civil society of, of, of a city together. And then this form of liberalization, flexibilization, individualization, you come to a museum, when you want and uh, within the opening hours with no shared encounter, shared space, um, with um, you yourself decide where you go, how long you stay and so on. Um, and, and in an abstract form it looks like this. Yeah? Um, and to, to develop this form that is open to all, <coughs> of course we know museums are not open to all, but that was the idea, 
Um, but, and yet it's not the same for all. Bringing together mass access in uh, 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 and individualization is quite a historical achievement, we could say. Um, however, um, so three consequences. First, art as we know it and cu so cultivate it is, is rather part of the problem than part of the solution. Uh, we have to understand that art and modern aesthetics um, with their paradigm of autonomy, tell your children to not read too much Kant, it's harmful, um, co-produced and still co-produces the attitude that generated this crisis. Um, is separated an industrial productive relation to the world and world in which the world is basically mastered. So we still say, you know, but art, should be, uh, art has to be free. Yes, it sounds great, but this idea of freedom is of course the same, comes from the same mindset that generated the whole puzzle, <laughs> I mean the whole problem we are facing now, right? Um, it's a contaminated idea of freedom uh, in modern aesthetics and that's why we need new, a new form of aesthetics. Um, so second point, because we are now confronted with the economic, social and ecological consequences of this imperative of separation, we want to bring all these things that we have been separating throughout the past 200 years into disciplines, into boxes, into specializations which we all also benefit from largely nature from culture, product from process, the individual from social connections, rationality from other modalities of consciousness and knowledge. We want to somehow bring this all back together. Um, proximity, uh, connectivity, uh, where um, notions that came up all the time in our morning discussions. Um, so this is difficult enough, but it's extremely difficult to do this within a spatio-discursive format that historically emerged to do exactly the opposite. Um, which is, so it means to strive against basically the karma of the white cube, <laughs> right? So you might think why not then really come up with something new? Um, because it's almost impossible uh, to, to basically use a space that has a history of 200 years to, liberali to liberalize, to flexibilize, to detach. I mean, we heard this wonderful project yesterday about this Australian um, um, uh, indigenous um, uh, uh, work. And I mean, this incredible work and, and, and thinking that goes into connecting two generations from 350 generations ago, right? Amazing. I mean, all this connectivity that goes, that this is connected to. But of course, Western civilizations have done the, the exact same amount of work and labor and thinking to do exactly the opposite, to detach, to separate, to segregate. And maybe they had their reasons for, for a while, but um, we, we have to shift somewhere some to something else. So, which brings me to my last um, point. Art is something like I would say, an applied philosophy in of open liberal societies. Its role is to experiment with new forms and structures of thinking, to model new forms of being, I mean, philosophically speaking, new ontologies, if you like, and in doing that, to make substantial proposals how we can develop further. Uh, the French philosopher uh, uh, Jean-Luc Nancy once said that every artwork produces an idea of the world, not in what it represents or depicts or in what it is about. But it is a world. It, so in, in its way, it's a, that's a little bit abstract now, I admit. In its way of being, in its ontolo ontology, <laughs> so to speak. And I want to um, close, and, and there it, it's actually not so complicated. It, when you look at these images, it becomes pretty clear. Um, so I want to show you two works, and I would love to add as a third one this, this um, this this floor painting, if you like, um, uh, but I, I can. I'm <laughs> not prepared, obviously, but I think that would be wonderful. So the left one is Walter, uh, the the upper one is Walter de Maria, uh, 13, 14, 15 meter rose from 1985, which, in its technical perfection of highly refined industrial production, demonstrates all aspects of the industrial or mechanical age. 
So we could say it's linked to a utopia of economy, which at the same time is the utopia of the industrial age. The artwork is an end product, um, uh, where, you know, um, uh, rooted m in a kind of circular mode of, uh, in a kind of demiogic mo model of the of, of economy. The other is, mo most of you, or many of you will recognize it, it's Pierre Wieck, uh, work for Documenta, uh, um, 13 and 2012 um, in Kassel, so um, the, the, the composting area. Um, so the cleared space um, against an overgrown, inscrutable, complex space without categorical separations of nature and culture of animate and inanimate material, rooted more in the circular uh, model uh, mode of ecology, where the heter um, heterogeneity of uh, components that have not been reshaped by industrial mechanical processes, which um, then moves, as we could say, into the direction of a utopia of ecology in which nature is no longer merely a resource, but it is itself perceived as an effective apparatus in terms of its complexity and refinement. Um, I'm going to end here because I know time is over. Of course, the question is how can this be translated, such a thinking be translated into um, formats of, of, of exhibitions? Um, uh, mm, this artist is working on that. Um, it's a speculative um, endeavor, and I think it's, it's going to cost us a few more decades to probably come wi up with really uh, uh, sustainable solutions, but um, I think that's the work to be done. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.